Well, welcome to this special edition of the Hinckley Report, our online edition where we'll be talking about the primaries, which was so exciting for all of us here in the state of Utah. I know you all stayed up all night long uh, to watch the results come in, which was interesting. Some of the results more unexpected, some very much expected. So we want to get to all those things today. First, let me introduce our great guest today, Brian King, representative, the House Minority Leader, Lisa Riley Roche, political reporter with the Deseret News, and Glenn Beebe, political reporter with Channel 4 News. So glad to have you all with us today. Let's start with uh, the race, which really came as no surprise, but I want to see if there were any interesting points in there. This is the Mitt Romney race, uh, Dr. Michael Kennedy, Representative King. So 43 points. That's how big the spread was for Mitt Romney. That was kind of expected to, it was to, to be kind of high. Was there anything unexpected in this particular election? Uh, I don't. I think that some of the lead in to the election was interesting in the sense that you had uh, Representative Kennedy sort of trying to gain points by uh, Going back on uh, some of the comments that Rep or that Senator that Governor uh, Romney made yeah, about one? <laughs> all of these things. <laughs> well, there were these comments about the preacher who was uh, invited to pray over mm -hmm. in Israel. I thought that was kind of interesting, but the end result I don't think is interest or surprising at all. I mean, Mitt Romney has such high name recognition, former presidential candidate. I mean, he's sort of a favorite son of Utahns. Uh -huh. Lisa, was it about the name ID? Did this this kind of this mistake by Dr. Michael Kennedy uh, sink? him or not not really well, impact that much I, I don't think anyone uh, didn't expect Mitt mm -hmm. Romney to do very well in in this primary I, I think all along the anticipation was Mitt Romney is is uh, much loved in Utah mm -hmm. he uh, it's not just name recognition he has a history here he ran the Olympics did did very well he ran for president twice and did very, very well in, in Utah. Mm -hmm. I think what's more interesting about this race is maybe the impact it's going to have on the whole debate over the caucus convention system. A mm -hmm. uh, big win for Romney may be a big loss for that system because mm -hmm. it, it tells us once again that delegates to conventions are not picking the kind of candidates that can do well. Mm -hmm. Because remember, Mike Kennedy beat Mitt Romney at the state convention by a couple of points. Now, advocates of the caucus convention system will say it was only two points, that Mitt Romney came in with a huge name ID, but it's more than that. Yeah. It's, it's more that, once again, emphasizing that huge disconnect that we've seen over and over again from, from back when Governor Herbert was pushed into a primary by Jonathan Johnson at convention, that the Curtis Herod race the first time around, we saw it repeated again. That's interesting. Well, what, so let's, we should pick up on this because this was an underlying theme, right? So you have uh, Mitt Romney winning this one by a large margin. You had Congressman uh, Curtis winning by a large margin. You add those to the two that you mentioned before, Curtis last time, Governor Herbert again. Glenn, is this really the, the death knell for the caucus convention system? Is this, they just give us the wrong candidates or is I think something yes else? Yes and no, because I think what... What, as you pointed out, that we're seeing is that they're not picking the people that the people want. Why is that? And so I think the caucus convention system maybe just will kind of have some growing pains in this new era of primaries. But I think that a lot of people still like it as a stopgap measure. They don't necessarily want someone to be able to come in and buy an election. They don't want someone with just a large name recognition and a lot of money and big donors to be able to come in and buy up a bunch of ad time just to get their name out there. Mm -hmm. I think delegates still want a system where they can put forward a candidate that meets their party ideals. Mm -hmm. So, Robson, this is so interesting because this was the tagline, right, of the people say keep the convention system that's just rich people now buying signatures and then buying a seat yeah. it didn't seem to resonate though well no I do think there is this this primary election does highlight the disconnect that exists between the delegates and the voters and one of the interesting things that people don't recognize is that this uh, SB 54 that passed a few years ago that put in place an alternative route to the ballot for candidates and it was a uh, follow-up and sort of a response to Bob Bennett, among others, being 
thrown out unceremoniously. That passed the Utah State Legislature and it survived challenges since then because we're, the, the Democrats got behind it. Mm -hmm. It was such a close vote. I mean, it's narrowly, pa it narrowly passed in the first place and it's narrowly escaped being uh, rescinded by the legislature on a number of occasions since then because the Democrats hung together and saying, mm -hmm. we like this alternative path. So the idea that Democrats don't have an impact in Utah that's pretty good evidence that the, um, the Democrats have made the difference mm -hmm. with regard to this alternative route to the ballot. Oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I, I'm interested, Representative King, in, in the difference between how Democrats handled their convention versus Republicans, right? Democrats had strong challenges from the left right. to two of your, your major candidates, Jenny Wilson in the Senate race and uh, Ben McAdams mm -hmm. in the congressional race. Right. And they both easily defeated their opponents at convention, creating this image that Democrats were were together pushing forward maybe more moderate candidates, where Republicans did just the opposite. Mm -hmm. Curtis barely missed uh, winning outright, and Romney, of course, came in second. No, I think that's right. I think that being in the minority status drives home more the point that you got to be careful about the candidates that you nominate. And if you want to escape minority status, you have to begin to appeal to a better extent than you have in the past to moderates, to pragmatics. And I, and I think what you're seeing among the Democratic delegates is a little quicker uh, bringing to a moderate and pragmatic position than you see among the Republican delegates at this point. And, and you know what? That's going to stay the same until the Republicans start losing some significant elections in Utah, in my opinion. And I think what we might end up seeing with the whole caucus convention system, it may become like the Democratic and Republican conventions for president. I remember in the 50s and 60s when it really mattered, you know, the votes on the floor, everyone was working mm -hmm. delegates. Now it's more of just a primetime showing. Everyone knows who the candidate's going to be. So I think it might just end up morphing into something where if you need it as a backstop, you can truly use it. But for the most part, it's going to be for candidates getting their name out there and meeting people. I think that's what it might end up morphing into here in the future. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in Utah, people think that uh, this is just a problem in the Republican Party because they're the only ones that kind of have this, this system. But to Lisa's great point, the Democrats follow the same process oh, absolutely. In, in Utah. But maybe they're putting out a different kind of candidates that are, that are maybe more likely to win some of these races. But what do you think is going to happen in the legislature? Are we done? Is, is it going to stand now, or do you hear anything as a legislator suggesting that we might see some people picking at the edges of this? Oh, I think you'll see people picking at the edges of it again. I think it depends on, to a large extent, what happens in November. I mean, we're going to have a, a turnover, I predict, of at least a third of the membership of the House in mm -hmm. November. We've already got about 18 uh, legislators in the House that we know are leaving, but you have the ability to get up to 25 or more turnover uh, because of people who are incumbents being defeated in the election. I really think there's going to be such a turnover that you could see significant changes in what we do going forward. Uh -huh. Well, t tell me, with these changes, some, some have thought that this primary was going to give us some kind of view, maybe a blue wave is coming. Do we see any of that in this uh, primary election? Any kind of hint? that there may be uh, mass change in terms of Democrats being voted into office? Well, uh, that's, that's a great question. I think it depends on uh, very much a, a district by district uh, uh, analysis. You've got some great candidates in tough districts that I think have an excellent chance of getting elected even though they're in uh, districts that have been held by Republicans in the past. But I think you've got some excellent Republican incumbents too who can or are well positioned to withstand even a bit of a blue wave. In terms of how big a blue wave there, we're going to see if one at all, mm -hmm. I think that's going to depend on what happens between now and November. Mm -hmm. What are you hearing about that, Lisa? It, well, <clears throat> it, it's hard to say that in a state like Utah we're going to suddenly see this, this uh, surge of Democratic mm -hmm. uh, candidates winning. We, we may see in some specific races, but in, in the big races, of course, the, the Senate race, uh, the House, House races, I, I think uh, the, the one where we may actually see a real fight is in the 4th Congressional District. Yeah, right, I, uh, I agree with, that, yeah. with with Representative uh, Mia Love mm -hmm. being challenged by Salt Lake County Mayor Ben McAdams, that uh, that race is getting tighter and tighter mm -hmm. and more and more competitive, and I, I think that the Democrats are probably putting a lot of their resources into that race and a lot of attention on that race, mm -hmm. showing that that maybe there's a chance, as Jim Matheson was able to do for many That's years, right. find that kind of moderate, uh, independent path 
to, to getting a D in the mm -hmm. congressional delegation. Okay. And, and I think, you know, Brian kind of said it, it, it will depend on what happens between now and November because I don't think Democrats have that um, fire that they did right after the 2016 election. I think some of that's died out. Mm -hmm. I think you see spurts of it here and there, but it really, you know, it always comes down to turnout and Democrats always do better when mm -hmm. turnouts higher but they have to be able to get people to the polls and that can be a yeah. tough thing for Democrats sometimes and so I, I, I think it will matter what happens between now and then a lot can happen between now and then even if it's a national issue that sparks uh, I think uh, you know as you said I don't think we're gonna see a giant like blue wave here in Utah but then again you never know because there's a lot mm -hmm. of new candidates we've we've met a lot of them who got on through the signature process or however mm -hmm. they did and you know, sometimes when you have those new candidates, they don't know any better, so they just go around knocking doors, getting people's yep. votes, and before you know it, they surprise you. I mean, we saw that in New York with a congressional district. Uh, mm -hmm. A major Democrat got knocked off, but she even tweeted out her shoes recently, and they're just worn down because all she did was walk around and mm -hmm. knock on doors. So when you get some of these candidates who don't have the resources, sometimes it's the things that they don't know that mm -hmm. end up helping them and getting them the votes. Yeah. You know, in CD2, we've got a great candidate, Shireen Gorbani, who is running for the Democrats. and. Uh, Chris Stewart, uh, many people like him. He's been a low-profile uh, congressman in, in, from my perspective, and I think most people would say so. Um, that's not to say that he's done a poor job or he's, he's surely going to get elected, out, uh, get voted out, but I do think that Shireen Gorbani has shown great energy in that race, and she is doing her best to try and capture hmm. people's imagination and get her message out. And, you know, she lacks the funding compared to an incumbent Chris Stewart, but that's something that you ought to keep your eye on if you want to sense for whether there's going to be a blue wave. Hmm. But don't the Democrats have the same issue in Utah that they have nationally, that split between the progressive wing of the party and the more moderate or mainstream or establishment wing of the party? How do you get those progressives uh, enthused to get out and vote when you have more moderate candidates being advanced. Well, there's no question that that can be an issue in the same way that it's an issue among the right wing of the uh, political spectrum, too. However, again, I think being in the minority at a federal level and being in a super minority here in the state level causes Democrats, makes them more likely to come together and say, we're going to set aside differences. What we're trying to do is get behind a candidate that can win. And if they don't do that, they're going to be in the, a permanent minority status. It's as simple as that. And I think that's true for candidates across the spectrum, again, whether they're political, whether they're Democratic or Republican. But the margin for error for infighting among Republicans in Utah is much greater than the margin for error among Democrats. <laughs> well, and I think one of the things that we kind of missed about the primary was how high the turnout was. Yeah. It, it was very high this year. I think that's because there's a lot of mail-in balloting. But what's going to be interesting to see, what I think could make the difference or is going to be the reason for a surprise is a lot more people, no matter what side of the aisle are on, just seem to be more politically involved. They kind of don't like where the conversation is nationally. And we have one of the highest turnout rates for people who are registered to vote, yet for eligible voters, we're very low uh, on, on the totem pole. So if more people get registered or just more people get involved, that I think will make the surprises one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and not to put too fine a point on it, but our turnout for this primary was uh, probably, looks like it may be the highest we've had in the last 20 years, mm -hmm. which is interesting. I, I think it's very encouraging in the sense that, you're, as Glenn said, you're, you're seeing people focused on politics politics who haven't really mm -hmm. paid attention in the past. And for a midterm election too, a primary and a midterm mm -hmm. election, you'd think that would be pretty low turnout. As high as it was, I think is encouraging for the idea that however they vote, whether it's a Republican or Democrat or third party, you're going to have Utahns more likely mm -hmm. to come to the polls in November. The, the Romney people that I spoke with took credit for, at least in uh -huh. large part, for that, that high turnout. And, and I mean, let's be realistic, it's a statewide race. There were tons of TV ads, relatively speaking, um, to remind people, here's Mitt Romney, here's someone you know, here's someone you remember and, and loved from the Olympics. He's on the ballot again. Remember how many times you voted for him? And Mike Kennedy right, was out right. there too. So people really felt, I think, motivated in a way they usually don't in a, in a primary. And, and let's not forget the whole Trump factor too, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this idea that people, if they don't like what they're seeing coming out of Washington or parts of what they're seeing coming out of Washington, they need to get involved, they mm -hmm. need to vote. I think we almost have to look at the Trump factor in this this, <laughs> this race, right? Because on the, for the Republicans and the Democrats, both of them are approaching the, I guess is your phrase here, the Trump factor in a different a different way. For the Democrats, how, how do they capture what's happening in the White House to their advantage? 
Well, that, that's a great question. And I think what you have to do is not talk about Trump directly. Mm -hmm. People know how they feel about Trump one way or the other. I mean, there are very few undecideds, right? And if you attack Trump in a way that is calculated to try and persuade Trump voters that they shouldn't vote for him, you're banging your head against the wall. It's not going to happen. What you need to do, I think, is talk about local issues in a way that contrasts how Donald Trump mm -hmm. approaches national issues. Talk about character. Talk about the importance of honesty. Talk about uh, the importance of listening. Talk about the importance of serving in a selfless way. All things that Donald Trump fails to do very well, in my humble opinion. So I think that what you can do is talk about Donald Trump without talking about him, mm -hmm. but talking about what you are going to do as a candidate on a local level in a way that naturally leads a person on their own to recognize what a contrast exists between local Democrats and national Republicans in the form of Donald Trump. Hmm. So Lisa, the, the, uh, the other side of this is interesting too, because it seems like maybe at least Mitt Romney was trying to follow this <laughs> His exact same strategy that Representative oh, King Mitt said. Mitt Romney did not want to talk about Donald Trump. Uh, <clears throat> Mitt Romney uh, was was pushed constantly by the national press he was receiving to say what he was going mm -hmm. to do in Washington. Are you going to be a Jeff Flake or a John McCain? Uh, are you going to get out there and constantly be a be a contrast as a Republican to the president and challenge him constantly? Yeah. And and the answer was no. Uh, Romney said all along, in fact, he said it to, to uh, myself and my colleague Dennis Romboy when we sat down with him for his first interview the day he announced, I will speak out against Romney or, or speak out against Trump when he uh, does things that I disagree with. But I also support a lot mm -hmm. of his agenda, the tax cuts and, and other things, and I'll, I'll support those. And let's not forget that Trump endorsed him via Twitter, of course. Uh, shortly after he got mm -hmm. in the race and tweeted his congratulations. Mm -hmm. So, so put, he's trying to have it both ways, and uh -huh. that's going to be interesting. Maybe that's the opportunity for uh, for Jenny Wilson in this race, yeah. is to make it so he can't have it both ways. Well, and I think what's interesting about that is that when you actually, I think some new polling came out that said many Utahns separate Trump's personality and some of those things. They say they don't like that, but they, they like his policies. And so that's an interesting factor because normally when you pull someone, you take the whole person, you know, warts and all, as they would say. But I think people separate his policy from the person that he is or some of the things that he does on TV. And I think that's why it's a tough issue for a Republican or a Democrat mm -hmm. to take on because a Republican can latch themselves to the president and that might not necessarily help them because some people may not like his personality or they, they may just like his policies. But for Democrats, I think it's tough because a lot of people separate Donald Trump the person from Donald Trump the policy. Mm -hmm. And that that's why it can be a, a tough nut to crack here for Democrats, p personally, I think, because they they don't associate his behavior with his policies. They like his policies. Well, and, and, and to your point, Glenn, you've got that Supreme Court appointment mm -hmm. coming up. So let's talk about the Supreme Court factor because that is as big as any, right? So, in fact, a lot of Utahns, when we when we talk to them about about President Trump when they when they voted for him uh, initially said the Supreme Court pick is the most important thing in our minds right we we know the president's four years but this is for our lifetime they liked Neil Gorsuch it seems how big of a deal is this that the president gets to pick another Supreme Court justice oh it's a huge deal it's a huge deal I've heard people say I mean you got to take into account and Donald Trump said this himself on the on one of his campaign uh, appearances I can't remember in what, mid what Midwestern state he was in but he said we want to pick someone who's going to be there for 40 or 45 years so this the, the impact of this choice will far outlive Donald mm -hmm. Trump and uh, that's why it's so critically important of course, we look back at the stolen Supreme Court seat involving Merrick Garland mm -hmm. and say, hey, you shouldn't be vote, bring up for a vote somebody who in the same year that there's an election because the, the composition of the Senate could change. Uh, but, you know, our friend uh, uh, Mitch McConnell says, well, what was good in 2016 is not good in 2018. So 
whatever. But but I think what we're going to end up doing is saying to Utahns, listen, when you talk about the policies of Donald Trump, do you favor separating families at the border? Mm -hmm. Do you favor eliminating or undermining to the greatest extent possible uh, access to of affordable health care for Utahns? I mean, there's a long list of stuff that just on the policies alone, I think Utahns have problems with in terms okay. of Donald Trump. Well, let's put this great insight with, with what you two have been saying on the end of your, in your terms of your reporting, because I think that's interesting. If, if Glenn, what Glenn said was right, that there's a lot of things you're willing to overlook as voters in terms of character or other sorts of things because we like the policies. That's kind of what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if he picks a Supreme Court justice that c kind of sticks to the party line, a conservative person, is he just clear clear all through the next general election for president? Not necessarily because he can always say or do something else, but conservatives love that. I mean, as, as you know, they said during the election year and as they say now, the Supreme Court's one of the most important things. And the Kennedy thing, he was a swing vote. So I think when it comes to like LGBTQ issues and uh, other, other things like that, I think uh, that's where Democrats feel the loss. But if you actually look at some of the biggest cases that have been there, he's normally gone with the conservative side. So you sometimes wonder how much is really being lost at this point. And uh, I, I think sometimes these so rarely come up that every time it comes up, we, we think it's like the biggest deal. But then you look at people like Clarence Thomas and, and others who are on the court that are also getting older that could be uh, could be retiring soon as well. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of a wait and see. Obviously, this is going to be big for conservatives. But when mm -hmm. it comes to that seat and, and everything else, it's it's one of those where, if anything, it's going to make conservatives excited. But this is an opportunity for Democrats to say that every election matters. Mm -hmm. And That's in all true. honesty, that, that should be their talking point. I, I think you're exactly right. There's there's so much that can happen between now and, and the, uh, what is it, the fall uh, confirmation mm -hmm. that the uh, Majority Leader McConnell is planning on, on this Supreme Court nominee. There's so, so, so many things that can happen, right? I mean, uh -huh. in this administration, if, if nothing else, we, we know that from day to day, things change dramatically, and summer's just getting started. We got a long <laughs> time to, until true. the election. And you look at Collins. I mean, she's even said, if if someone is going to overturn Roe v. Wade, I will not vote for them. You look at Jeff Flake saying, we need to deal with tariffs, or I won't give you the vote. It's a razor thin margin. Mm -hmm. So if you get one or two Republicans who are going to use that as leverage, especially some who are heading out the door and you know don't need to worry about their next election, it could be interesting for that confirmation process. Yeah, I think that's true. And I do think that there'll be a lot that Democrats can talk about between now and November on policy. I mean, mm -hmm. Donald Trump's uh, odious character, uh, I think, is a given, and we all know about it. But when you're talking about policy, let's the one the signal accomplishment from last year for this Republican Congress was the tax reform bill, right? When you get into the details of tax, that tax reform bill with people, it does not poll well, even in Utah. It does not do well. So there are a lot of things on policy that I'm happy to talk about with Donald Trump, even in bright, bright red Utah, that would cause me to say, listen, if you really do care about policy, you don't really want to talk about the character of Donald Trump, it's what he's doing. The only thing you can feel good about is the Supreme Court stuff, mm -hmm. because the policies that he's pursuing are not in accordance with Utah values. Interesting. So how would that change, Lisa, if we have one of the Lee brothers? <laughs> Well, I from bet. Utah, we should describe this right. Make sure everyone knows we got two people from Utah we do. on the short list. List of 25 people, uh, a list that was put together during the presidential campaign as a way mm -hmm. for uh, a volatile candidate to reassure the base that he really was going to look at what was most important to most mm -hmm. conservative voters, having a, a conservative uh, on the Supreme Court uh, to fill that spot that was not filled by Merrick Garland. Uh, I, th I think what what you're going to see here, though, is is uh, the two two Lee brothers are going to get some some discussion here in Utah. But I think already we're not really hearing their names at the national level. So I don't know. It, it, again, with Donald Trump, all bets are off, right? What might make the most sense for a, a president in his position to do is not necessarily what we're going to see him do, whether it's the most political sense or policy sense or whatever other mm -hmm. sense, right? Yeah. I mean, he's, he's gonna do what he's going to do, but we have Senator Mike Lee, and we have his brother uh, Thomas, Thomas Lee, mm -hmm. who's a Supreme Court Justice in Utah. Uh, Mike Lee doesn't have experience on the bench, his brother obviously does, but Mike Lee is, is well known among conservatives, well liked, um, it's possible. Mm -hmm. I will say this, if either one of the Lee brothers are chosen, 
it'll be a big leg up for Republicans running for office in Utah to say, you should be backing Donald Trump. Uh -huh. He's good to us in Utah. Mm -hmm. He's doing things that give Utah and Utahns greater influence in the making of federal policy. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, before we, we close, uh, one comment I want to hear from you, Representative King. It was interesting we had two uh, two great candidates from the Democrats in the first congressional district. One of them will be taking on, well, now I know, uh, Congressman Bishop. How, how significant is it do you see that you see not just pe people stepping up from the Democratic Party, but actually having challenges yeah. within it? Oh, I think that this has been a year that you've seen a lot more involvement and activity among Democrats. For example, in legislative races in the House, in 2016 we had 20 Republicans who were running that were unchallenged by Democrats. This year that was down to 12. And so I think that what we're seeing is, again, part of this is the Trump factor. Part of this is just, however, a greater interest in and recognition of the importance that politics has and the impact that it has on our lives. It doesn't matter where you are on the political spectrum. If you want your voice heard, if you want an opportunity to have an influence over these critical, critically important public policy decisions, you better get out and run for office. It can be state, it can be local, it can be federal. But get out and get involved, run for office. It's got to be the last comment, but it really is good to see. You have two options, really, when you're upset. You can disengage or you can just go right for it. And we're definitely seeing more of the latter, which I'm happy to see as well. Thank you for your great insights. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.